started. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, welcome. This is the Learning the Power of the Not My Responsibility Mindset talk. Uh, my name is Nick Leghorn. Um, I run the Information Security Risk Management Team at Indeed here in Austin, Texas. Um, I've, I've wanted to give this talk for a while now, and I'm, I'm borrowing heavily from our boss, Zaid, on this. Um, there is a problem in information security, especially with employment. Um, it generally follows this kind of cycle where as soon as you get hired at a place, there's this immediate optimism, this cool, I'm going to go fix all the things. You hired me to do all the stuff. We're going to go out and rule the world. Uh, and as things progress, you find places you want to impact. You find things that you want to change. You try and make it happen and you don't get the traction that you're looking for. There's some pushback from the business. You don't find that you're being as effective as you thought you would be. Um, and that leads to frustration, and frustration leads to burnout, and then burnout leads to turnover. And then you go to the next job, and the cycle starts again, where you get hired, optimistic, find a thing to change, doesn't change, get tired, burn out, start again. And I have felt this at companies I've worked for. I've been... I've worked at Mitel, I've worked at Shortel, I've worked at uh, Rackspace, I've worked at a bunch of different places, and it's the, the same thing over and over again, right? So what I wanted to do, and indeed, was I wanted to find a way to take this responsibility off of us. Because the, the reason for this burnout, the reason that people start to uh, feel this, uh, this burnout is because they, they feel like they're responsible for security. We're responsible people. We want things to be secure. We are the people that should be doing that. Uh, and so we feel personally responsible for the security of the company. We feel that if the company gets hacked, if there's a problem, that it's ours to fix. That is something that we need to be working on. Um, and in reality, that's not really the case. It's our job to point out what's going on. It's our job to help the business understand how bad the things are. It's not our job to fix them. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, how we're implementing some things that indeed that are uh, in that line, that help put the emphasis back on the business, that instead of taking all that responsibility on ourselves, we're making the business aware of what's going on and it's providing a cooperative instead of a adversarial relationship. So let me take an example. Um, and I, I realize this is an application security conference and I'm, I'm gonna talk about a networking issue because I'm a network guy. Um, but this could be anything that the company wants to do that's particularly dumb. Um, in this case, if someone, like a manager, wants to remote desktop into production from anywhere on, on the road without a VPN, uh, that's not a great idea, um, obviously. Uh, that's why VPN exists, is to make these things secure. Um, but this could be, there's a vulnerability discovered in the code that engineering doesn't want to fix. This could be um, a feature that takes precedent that has some security vulnerability inherent in it. This could be anything that's uh, an issue that you want to find and fix. In this case, uh, stuff like this at previous companies I've worked out has been ways that ransomware has gotten in the system. It's ways that they've had uh, breaches and, and other issues. Um, so this is a huge problem. If in a normal situation, right, it's the engineering department says, I need X, I need this thing, I need to open up these ports, I need these firewall rules done, I need this functionality. Um, the request goes to the network team, network team goes to security and says, hey, this is a stupid idea, I don't want to do it, help me. Um, and at that point, really, it's not much that we can do about it. They're in a different org structure, right? If we're over here in information security and networking, right? Uh, and engineering is in a completely different part of the business, it's hard to get that cross-functional support to say that this is a bad idea. It's a lot easier for their management to say that no engineering or networking is being a blocker or uh, security is stopping us from doing this. It's 
um, that adversarial concept again. Engineering really wants to do this. They see there's obviously a benefit to it. They're just not seeing the downside of it as much. And so they don't understand that concept. They keep pushing forward. Security is seen as a blocker. Everyone's sad because there's fighting and, and confusion and frustration. Uh, and at the end of the day, they just do it anyway because they want engineering to shut up and go away. Um, so that's the normal way of happening, right? Is there's frustration, there's anger, there's confusion, there's fighting. Um, but in reality, it's, there's two aspects of this. One is security needs to understand how bad do we want to fight this? Like, is this, the, is this the hill that we want to die on? And the second is we need the business to understand how bad of an idea this is. So that's kind of where risk comes in, is to help ease that conversation and put that decision-making capability back where, it's, uh, back where it belongs. The, concept of the alignment of power and responsibility. If you want to do this thing, you should understand what you're doing, um, you should understand the risk it poses, and you should be able to balance that out. Um, Indeed's ethos thing, mission statement, is that we help people get jobs. My team's uh, mission statement is that we help the business take healthy risks. Um, what I mean about that is risk isn't a value, risk isn't necessarily a uh, a point in time, security isn't a destination, security is the journey, right? And depending on the kind of business, depending on um, how the business feels, uh, can determine whether they want to be fast or they want to be secure, right? Uh, the the three-legged stool of fast, secure, and cheap. Um, it, generally, looking at just the security versus speed aspect, you can be anywhere on this, this uh, anywhere on the spectrum. You can be super fast and insecure if you're trying to get into a new market, if there's a new project that you're trying to launch that uh, the company is not gonna survive if it doesn't uh, get this right. Um, you can be super secure if you've got an established thing in the market and you don't really need to innovate that much but you're more concerned about losing market share, then security is more of a concern. Um, and in reality, we as security people want to be on the secure side of the spectrum, but that's not necessarily the correct call for the company. Uh, so what we as security people need to do is understand where on the spectrum does the company want to be, and then we need to help them make the decisions to let them stay at that spot, to identify when things exceed their tolerance, if this is too risky for things they want to do, uh, or if this is an acceptable risk that they want to do. So, why do we manage risk? We manage risk because it helps the business understand where they are right now on that spectrum. Uh, it gives them an understanding of are they being too fast? Are they being too secure? Can they take more risk? Um, it allows the business to define their risk tolerance. It lets them tell us what they care about so that we can determine um, how do we measure that? How do we know that we're in the right spot? How do we help them make those decisions? Um, and then for businesses where they don't quite have that knowledge yet, uh, starting to catalog and document uh, the decisions that they are making, because uh, they're, even if they don't have a uh, mature risk management function yet, they're gonna be able to intuitively understand this feels too risky, this feels okay, and by documenting those decisions, we're gonna be able to understand where on that spectrum they fall and help them figure that out themselves. So there's two aspects to this, right? So the first is, is this the hill that security wants to die on? And the second is helping the business understand how bad of an idea this is. So the way that we break that out is operational versus strategic risk. So operational risk is about do we care? Is this something that we care about? If I have a queue of 600 network requests coming in to open up ACLs, right? Which of these 600 do I want to spend my resources on? Because I, as a security engineer, can't do all of them. I can't spend the same amount of time on all of them. Are there some that are more important than others? How do we define that? Um, so if we can define the risk posed by each of those requests, uh, we can start stack ranking. We can start identifying maybe this one needs additional scrutiny. Maybe this one's okay to, to proceed as is. Uh, so instead of having uh, just one bar, maybe we can set different bars based on the risk it poses. Uh, it's transactional, operational risk is transactional focused on specific requests. So request response sort of thing, queue management. Um, used to define a level of security and scrutiny. Um, understanding, doing operational risk requires you to understand the risk appetite, or at least have a guess of what the kind of risk appetite you're looking at is. 
Um, if the company hasn't defined it, maybe you just take a best estimate at, I think we can handle this level of tickets through our queue, or we can do this level of investigation. Maybe that's what sets our risk tolerance is just, what are we capable of doing? Uh, and then things that are, with, are exceeding that risk tolerance are things that we look at. Strategic risk is the should we care part. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about how this rolls up in a minute, but operational risks will inform strategic risks. If you have a bunch of little things that you've left through, maybe those all individually are okay, but in a group, they are actually a problem. It identifies a larger issue that needs to be attacked. Um, it's broader in scope, and in scope it can uh, incorporate dozens, hundreds, thousands of individual transactions, individual decisions. Um, one server with one missing vulnerability or one missing patch isn't necessarily a problem. 500 servers with the same missing patch might. It's designed to, uh, to inform at a higher level. So whereas operational risk is about for this request, what do we care about? Strategic risk is here's everything that's broken. Which of these things do you want me to fix first? Which of these problems should I uh, make a priority within my team? So when we talk about risk, um, even within the word risk, right? Risk, which is a, a, the probability of loss for a given event. Um, we can dissect that into a couple different ways. It's uh, likelihood and impact is something that's pretty common, but even there we can dissect likelihood into threat and vulnerability. We can talk about um, how, many, how many times per year do we expect someone to try and attack this? How likely are they to succeed? We can get super granular into this. My background, um, I, I did uh, terrorism risk analysis for DHS for a while. So understanding and trying to calculate out um, all the different probabilities of terrorism attacks in the United States gets to be super granular and confusing if you don't have a formula to figure that out. Um, so dissecting it into threat, vulnerability, and consequence gives us that ability to go to that granular level and get a, a value for these things. Um, but even within the higher levels, if you're just looking at likelihood and impact, or if you just want a category of threat, um, there's different ways we can communicate this. We can communicate in broad categories um, for, uh, if, you're, if you're just looking at risk, right? Just you want some t-shirt sizing of risk, a category is a great way to do it. Um, it's useful for quick analysis. Um, it's not very precise. Uh, the problems with using this sort of format for communicating it, um, if you, have a stakeholder who doesn't quite, isn't quite bought into your process, doesn't quite understand what you're doing, it can be confusing to say that this is a high risk without any supporting documentation. Um, but when you're trying to just do that quick initial uh, categorization of this request that's coming into my queue, do I care about it? Being able to define just t-shirt sizes of, of risk is very useful for that. Uh, if you want to get a little bit more granular, than that. Uh, similarly, just that single value for risk, right? Instead of that hierarchical one, two, three, four, critical, high, medium, low, um, annualized loss expectancy is a really good value to use, but that requires a lot of deep understanding of the problem and a lot of deep quantification of risk. Um, it's super useful for when you're trying to figure out mitigations. So if, um, if I have a situation where I'm looking at solutions that are in the millions of dollars per year to implement, trying to figure out if that makes sense as a company to invest in is a great thing to use annualized loss expectancy for. Um, so this is a measure of how, how much money per year do we expect to lose for these events. So if there's a $10,000 event that happens uh, once every 10 years, that's $1,000 per year for annualized loss expectancy that we can expect. Um, again, it's super technical, but it's very useful. Um, legal departments might have a problem with this if you start using it for um, talking about the impact of lawsuits, uh, just because writing down and quantifying the value of a potential lawsuit is potentially uh, discoverable in litigation and could be an issue. So going a step backwards from that, right? If we're starting at that high level of risk and trying to dissect it into more digestible chunks, we can also talk about just likelihood and expected impact. Um, we expect a thousand times a year this thing is gonna happen, it's gonna cost us a grand each time it happens, right? Um, someone spray paints my wall every year, it costs me 50 bucks to fix. That's 50 bucks that I put in the bank, I know that at the end of the year it's gonna wash out. Um, 
if you're talking to decision makers and stakeholders, it's a great way to illustrate how much of a problem is this thing that we expect to happen? Um, how bad could it be? Uh, and gives them that sort of t-shirt sizing concept as well without needing to go into annualized loss expectancy. Another good way of talking about it is not necessarily calculating your own impact. Um, we can know that for our company, if something like this happens, it's $5,000 to get back up and running, right? Um, that's still hypothetical. A good way of talking about it could, to management could also be other companies that have experienced this have seen X dollars in loss. The uh, breach reports, uh, the Verizon breach reports, I think, have a good uh, quantification of Companies that have seen this kind of breach have this kind of dollar value loss. We expect that in the next year we're going to have one of these events. Um, it really starts to put into perspective of how much does the company care about these sort of things. Um, if it's a huge value but it's really improbable, that might still be a thing they care about. So when we're talking about risk with management, or we're talking about risk internally, or we're using it for different versions of things, um, there's not a right way to talk about risk necessarily. It's just a right way to communicate. It depends on what you're doing. It depends on how you're using it. Um, so going back to operational versus strategic, right? Operational being that I have a queue I need to prioritize. Uh, the first two categories might be good ways of doing that to give you that stack ranking, but maybe it's not the right thing to communicate to management. Maybe management wants to understand a little bit more context around it, so you have to communicate differently. Um, the point being essentially that there's different ways of talking about it, and it doesn't need to be a single value that you come up with. It can be dependent. And so for us, uh, we've started using a multi-step approach that uh, has a different couple of different categorizations of risk for us. Um, so in that situation, going back to person wants to open up access to their data center from anywhere in the world, um, normally, like security would say, this is a dumb idea, push back, conversations happen, don't get a lot of, uh, don't get a lot of support and buy-in, um, just happens anyway, because there's a lack of understanding of how bad that thing is. Um, using a risk-based approach, maybe the first step is, well, let's analyze how bad is this thing actually. Um, it could be the situation that we're blowing it out of proportion. Maybe it's not as bad as we thought. Maybe there's mitigations in place that make it not such a bad idea. Um, so one of the ways that uh, we've come up with figuring out how, how much risk is involved in a thing without going really too depth in it um, is just a, a quick, uh, quick matrix of high, medium, low um, versus CIA. Um, we looked at all the things that we were getting, all the security requests we were getting, um, and really it boiled down to these are the categories that matter for the things that we were talking about is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, so data classification is number one or two on the CIS top 20, super important. Um, perimeter control, where is it going to? Um, and then is this something that's required for business operations, right? Um, and if you look at it in that aspect, you can start to very quickly and without asking a lot of questions, identify what are the things that we actually care about. If it's just something that's happening in QA versus something that's happening in production, maybe those are different things you look at with different intensity. So for our example of person wants to open up VPN or open up access to production without a VPN, that's super critical data because it's production. That's access to production, so it's crossing that trust boundary. Um, and it's real-time critical applications, so it's something that would impact the business immediately, so that's a high risk. So what does that mean for us? So we've identified that it's a high risk. This is still on operational risk management, right? This is that transactional, do we care about things? Um, we need to define what the priority is, and we need to figure out uh, how do we rank this? How, do we, how many resources do we put against this? So for a high risk level thing, for example, um, maybe, uh, maybe for low risk, we just let it go through. We have some standard mitigations we suggest, like cool, you're trying to do a thing, maybe you should think about doing this stuff. Maybe there's some things you can implement that would make it better. Um, but in general, like go ahead. Um, and for high risk things, those are the things that we actually care about. Uh, so we assign a team, we talk with stakeholders, we analyze it a little bit more in depth. Um, 
so for our high risk thing that's being asked of us, that would be the path we go down. Um, this is our top priority. This is the thing we need to do right now. Um, that goes to the top of the queue. Risk ownership. And this is, this is where we're starting to get out of the uh, responsibility on us and starting to put the responsibility back on the business. Um, I talked about alignment of power and responsibility earlier. And in reality, like it's not up to security to actually implement any of the things they're requesting. And it's not up to us to determine if this is something the business thinks is a good idea. That risk versus reward calculation isn't necessarily up to us. It's up to us to help them figure out if it meets that criteria or if this is something they want to look at more. Um, so in that lens, right, we need to figure out what level the business cares about different things. So a really simple way of doing that is we have figured out that this is a high risk. We figure out this is the thing we need to look at. Who in the business needs to look at this and sign off on it? to say, yeah, I've looked at this. I think this is okay for us. I think we're willing to, make, to take that risk. Um, and so for an example, um, having some documented chart and process. Chart and process is huge, by the way. Um, having a documented process of this is how we do things, this is how we analyze it, this is consistent every time, takes out a lot of the um, feeling like they're being ganged up on. Right? It's not security doesn't like me, they're not letting this through. It's not um, security is being a blocker. Um, it's now we have a process. We go through this process every time. This is consistent, this is documented, this is uniform. And it points out we're not the people that you should be talking to and complaining to. The person you should be talking to and complaining to for a high risk thing is actually this vice president or C-level over here that actually has the responsibility for safeguarding these things. It's not our job to make sure that we're safeguarding. It's this person's job. It's their responsibility. They need to be signing off on it. Uh, I almost liken this to security judo, right? We're not uh, blocking and tackling. We're not uh, stopping a person. We're using their own momentum and transferring it into risk reduction. We're transferring it into them having to discuss with management and prove that this is a good idea rather than us just trying to stop them and block them. So that brings us to, we need to describe to management how bad of an idea this is. Um, and the way that, uh, and incorporated with that, having some suggested mitigations in place is a good way of doing that. Um, so cool, this is a high risk. What would make it a medium risk? What would make it a low risk? What are the steps and the concrete things that could, you, uh, could be put in place, the things that could happen um, in order to reduce this level of risk? Um, and this is, seems like a very complex chart, but really it's cool, it's a high risk. We figured that out by asking the three main questions. Um, from there, we've got some mitigations we propose. We think that um, you should put a VPN in place. If you don't want to do that, it's still going to be a high risk. If you do put a VPN in place, maybe it's a medium, maybe it's a low. Um, but that reduces the seniority of the person you have to go talk to. Instead of having to go bother a C-level or a vice president, now maybe you just have to get your manager to sign off on it because it's not such a terrible idea. Uh, but by, by putting the requirement to talk to someone at a significantly high enough level, um, there's immediately the, oh crap, I don't really want to bother that person. Like there's that level of seniority and that respect for the position um, that makes people reconsider what they're doing initially. Um, and uh, provides a little bit of emphasis and helps them make the right decision to actually do something about it. Um, and if they think it actually is important to do this thing, then there's a pathway to do it. You just have to talk to that person and get them to understand it. So for us or for a notional uh, security team, like if there's something that's high risk, um, communicating it in a, an effective way um, just saying like, hey, we're not approving things. Like security team doesn't approve stuff that's not our job. We're here to tell you and inform your decision. We think that this is a high risk based on the process that we have. We're suggesting these mitigations for you. We think that you should do these things, which will reduce it to a, a lower risk level. If you don't do that, this is the person you need to go talk to. Okay, thanks, bye. Like that's a very simple statement that is very quick, easy to come up with. Getting to this point, is minutes, maybe an hour of work versus having to sit with the people, having to talk with them every time this comes up, having to go through this process and, and be that blocker. Um, now we're just 
we can categorize risks or categorize requests that come in into general buckets, and then based on what they're asking for, we can suggest pretty standard mitigations. Like the, the number of times that you see um, requests for specific things come in, it's going to be following a pretty consistent pattern. So if you can figure out what those things are that come in a lot, provide uh, consistent and pre-approved mitigations, it, it gets to be a very quick, very simple process. Instead of having to sit there and for each time figure out what you want to do, suggesting common mitigations uh, and a path forward. So what this does, right, is instead of this being a conversation at the low level, where it's uh, people in different silos that um, maybe disagree on what's going on or uh, don't understand the full context, uh, now instead of that project manager, network engineer, and infosec all fighting it out, um, now that project manager needs to go talk to a CEO or CTO. And they're the person who's making the request is now in the reporting chain of the person who has to approve it. So it's their management, it's people they understand, it's their risk to accept. So uh, they feel some responsibility to do the right thing. So important to do, right, uh, and important to note is that sometimes saying that this is a high risk is good enough. Sometimes saying we think this is a one in a thousand thing that will cost us $10 million is good enough. Um, it's going to depend on the decision maker. It's going to depend on who you're trying to influence and who you're talking to. Um, so starting with that t-shirt size of we think this is a high risk, we think this is a low risk, uh, that sort of thing, and moving on from there um, is good. Just understand that you're probably going to have to discuss this in a couple different ways depending on who you're talking to. So this is the important part. So that's all great, right? We've, using risk, we figured out a way to prioritize our queue. We figured out how do we identify the things that we want to work on, um, how do we know the, where we're going to get the most impact for our time used. Um, we're able to move the conversation away from information security is blocking us and onto my CTO is blocking me because this is a dumb thing I wanted to do. Um, but that still doesn't quite work, right? Because the CTO can just approve things. It doesn't really matter if there's no oversight, if there's no accountability. So how do we make sure that they're accountable? And that's the key part, is we need to be able to record what happened and report on it. And this is where that operational risk management flows into strategic risk management. So when, when that decision is made, right? So the CTO says, cool, you can go ahead and do this remove all these rules, open it all up, it's all good. How that looks, it isn't on the security team to have approved it. It's not even on the project manager to have approved it. It's on the CTO that he approved it. So when the CEO looks down and says, who's responsible for this giant uh, idiotic thing that we've done, the big red spot is on the CTO because it's his responsibility. Um, so we've now align power and responsibility. He was empowered to do that, but he's also responsible for the, re the results of his actions. And uh, put together with all the other risks that are, are done and accepted in the year, um, you can compile a report that shows who in the business has accepted the most risk, which people are responsible for opening these things. Um, and providing that visibility up to upper management, putting their name on the record, saying this person made this decision, this person took this action. Um, sunlight is the best disinfectant, right? Um, if these are allowed to happen in a vacuum, if people are allowed to just approve things willy-nilly and there's no reporting, there's no accountability, then it's gonna keep taking the path of least resistance, which is just get it done. Um, but by making them accountable and by putting their name on a list saying this person took this action, this person made this decision, and not the security guy. Security guy didn't make the decision, CTO made the decision. That takes the responsibility off the engineer, that puts the responsibility where it should be, and that makes sure that the people who are responsible for making the right decisions make the right decisions. So once we've got that, uh, once we have the right people identified, once we have the risks identified, the operational side is done, moving more into strategic risk management, um, it's entirely possible that 
that one decision to open up that access for production might not be the terriblest thing that happened that year. So if access to DC without VPN is down there at the bottom left, like in yellow, if we roll up everything that happened during the year, and we can, um, you can look through all the risks that have been opened, and you can start grouping them into common things. Uh, ACLs that have been opened, vulnerabilities for systems that aren't patched, um, applications that don't have uh, remediations for vulnerabilities that have been found through bug crowd. Whatever it is, you can roll these into larger and larger categories until it's up at uh, a level that management is more concerned about, uh, that higher level grouping. Um, so if data protection is the thing they care about, Right. We can dissect that into technical and um, technical attacks and unintentional leaks. We can dissect that even further. You can get down to understanding well, what, what is the thing? What is the thing that is the biggest risk for the company and how do I go about reducing risk? You inform decision makers about the level of risk they're taking and show them where this is happening. And so if that does come back, that access to the DC without a VPN is the biggest problem the company has, now, not only can you say, yes, this is our problem, you also can say, and the CTO approved this. So when you're, um, when you're talking to senior management, a good way of talking about it is that likelihood and impact thing. Um, so like I said, maybe, uh, so sensitive data leaking is the biggest thing. There might be some other things on there, but just keeping and rolling it up into larger and larger groups um, until you have a level of understanding that management cares about um, and displaying it even as something as simple as this, like with everything all rolled together where there's one chart that just shows all the things together at a very high level is a good place to start. If you've got nothing right now, if you're just saying there's a bunch of stuff out there, having something that's just broad categories is a great place to start. So what this is, right, um, for people who've gone through NIST or other compliance frameworks or whatever, probably recognize that this is just basically GRC that I've talked about, right? This is literally just GRC. This is um, risk informing governance. Right, so risk tolerance within the business informs what policies you create. Policies and governance, uh, and that's what management says needs to be done. And then governance is checked by compliance. Compliance sees, um, are these things actually being done in the business? And then level of non-compliance goes back and reinforms risk, which reinforms governance, and the cycle starts again. Uh, it's the circle of life. And this is, uh, it's a critical section of a security program. Right? If you're just sitting there and introducing, uh, if you're just being the squeaky wheel in, in the, the machine, right, uh, it's not necessarily going to be the most effective way to get things done. But if you have a process, if you have a way to influence the company, if you're making, um, if you're providing data-based decisions and data to support those decisions, it's a lot more effective. So what do we do? So, we, so by implementing a risk-based uh, approach to security management, right, you can improve the relationship between security and the business. You stop being a blocker, right? Instead of being a blocker, uh, the business now says, cool, how do I reduce risk, right? If, I'm, if my metrics are now about risk reduction, if I'm now being um, judged on how well I'm doing for risk reduction, um, they're going to actually look at you as uh, someone who can help, right? Um, they're going to understand, okay, I'm taking these actions, how can I mitigate them, what can we do to support that? Um, and not only that, you're not a blocker anymore. Like if the business wants to do something, that's fine. That's up to the business. That's not you to say no, that's not you to feel responsible for. Um, the business can take that risk and move forward, and now it's categorized, now it's cataloged. Maybe later we'll get back to it. But for now, the business says we're going forward, cool, that's great. Um, it improves visibility. So now we know what's wrong. Instead of um, maybe we've got a Word doc that we've been working on for years with all the terrible things that are wrong at the company uh, that we've been updating forever. Maybe we've got uh, a bunch of post-it notes somewhere with all this stuff. Instead of having it in different places, now we have a single place that has a good repository of here's all the things we need to fix. So when it comes time to say, well, tell me what we need to go after, I've got $5 million for a security budget this year, what are we gonna do? Now we've got actual intelligence that tells us these are the things that we care about, here are the high risk things within the business, this is where we need to go first. Um, 
and faster response time, right? One of the biggest challenges that I've had as a security engineer um, is I, it takes a lot of time to come up with a good response to a lot of the things that people ask for, right? Um, even for some of the small things, some of the small firewall changes or products that want to go out there, um, coming up with a good, um, a good, well thought out, sound response takes a lot of time. So being able to identify what do I actually want to, what requests, what things do I want to take the most time on, what do I want to spend my energy on, versus what are the things that I'm not really going to get good risk reduction for, um, being able to identify the difference between those two is huge and allows us to, uh, to let a lot of the lower stuff go with a lot less scrutiny. Um, we're still getting risk reduction. We're still going after the high value things, um, but maybe the things that don't matter so much, maybe we can provide some generic assistance and some generic advice, but they're not getting that, uh, the same level of effort and care that a company ending risk would get, right? So what do we get instead? So instead of feeling responsible, instead of being uh, the responsible person, feeling that burden on yourself, now you're putting the burden back on the business. Now it's up to the business to tell you, what do I care about? Are these things that matter? Um, so instead of feeling all that pressure yourself, you're putting it back on the business. Um, so when you attempt to provide security, managers actually support it. You actually have their support because now they're, being, they're the ones that are being judged. They're the ones with their names on the line. Um, so they are the responsible for ensuring security. So they actually want it to happen. So you get support. Uh, or you don't get support, they let it through, and it's not your problem anymore. It doesn't matter. Um, actual implementation of new measures. You actually get things done. Things actually improve. You feel better about it and you feel reinvigorated. So instead of burning out, that burnout is gone, and instead you get this sense of, wow, that actually worked. Someone actually wanted to do something. I want to do this again. And you get people that are reinvigorated uh, and, and want to continue. So that's, for me at least, that's how I've figured out how to get out of that burnout cycle and, and using risk to put that back on management using a consistent, well-documented format um, has been critical. Uh, I think our, our boss has said in the last couple months, like by implementing this process, he feels like the dog that caught the car. Um, he's, uh, he's been in this business so long and been fighting that battle for so long that he's not sure what to do when business actually helps. So um, it's, it works. Um, and I think that's pretty much the, the point. Um, that's all my stuff. Uh, I'm open for questions. Yeah. How do you deal with a C-level executive that refuses to take responsibility or tries to pass the buck down to lower level? So two aspects of that question, which is a good one. Um, by having a consistent and documented method, right, for saying people at this level accept this level of risk, um, you can't get them out of uh, accepting that risk. They're either going to have to accept them themselves or designate someone else to own that risk. Um, if they say that this risk can be accepted or mitigated by someone else, it's still them who has their name on the line. Uh, it's just the decision was made by someone else. Um, so that's, again, where that consistent documentation comes into play and is a huge factor. Yeah, but so that's that's where the the judo aspect comes back into play, right? Instead of um, if you set up yourself to be in line with those requests, um, if security has to sign off on network requests before they're done, then it's it's not a question of well, security didn't sign off on it; it's that person didn't sign off on it, and so now they're the blocker that has to have, come back and put their name on the line. Um, and so putting that into the process, that being the documented process of how things happen, is this person needs to put their name on it, gives them that concrete reason to go in and do that instead of that verbal, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, have you figured out a way to like, implement that or put that into change management or change request process? Yeah. Um, we've been pretty successful with network requests so far, at least. Um, in when a new request comes in, it goes to security for analysis and review. And then uh, the risk process takes over. There's a person that accepts. It's 
surprisingly little resistance to that process because we've been quick enough that we're not seen as the blocker, right? The problem comes in when if the process is so long and so tedious that it becomes the blocker itself, that's the problem. So um, having those three questions that we ask, right? Being so quick in the response is critical to getting that buy-in and people just going with the flow. Cool. All right, well thanks folks. That's, that's all I was gonna talk about today. <laughs>